I want to point out that I'm wearing a Stargate shirt. Stargate SG-1 is an amazing TV show and you should all watch it if you haven't. I love it. It's amazing. Okay, on with my video. Hello lovely internet strangers. Because I've just spent about two hours recording videos about Latinx for you, I'm a little bit tired so that's why I am sitting like this for the moment. In today's episode of the A Square, I'm going to discuss a couple of comments I've gotten recently on one of my most popular videos, the video where I talked about Jordan Peterson's and Brett Weinstein's opinions on polyamory, and I gave some context about my own experience of how I've practiced polyamory and how I've seen other people practice it, and also brought in research. And surprisingly, even though that video has over a thousand views, there are relatively few comments on it. Most of the comments I've received have been very positive, which was nice, but kind of unexpected. I expected to get a lot of backlash, so to speak, but in the past month I got a couple of comments that disagreed with me, which is totally fine, and I welcome such comments, but they didn't really fully disagree with me to the point that I could really respond to them, and they both kind of said that they could explain their disagreement, but they weren't going to or there wouldn't be a point. And I'm like, okay, then like, why did you comment at all if you don't actually want to potentially have some kind of dialogue here? Like, okay, you just want to say that you disagree? Cool. Like, I know that people disagree with me in the abstract, but you're not actually, you know, bringing like a specific point that you want to call me out for. So I will try to respond to these comments here to the extent that I am able. So let's take a look at them. One guy named, I would say Roanoke, but it's with an A, so Ranoke. They said, it is hard to process polyamory because it seems to be a moving target. Everyone has their own definition. And so any criticism of it can be easily deflected. I think the two people you mentioned are just going by the average rather than being ignorant. I found your refutation of some of their points not quite accurate, but I suspect going into detail is not really worth it. Okay, dude. All that to say, I think people should be free to do what they want, but it should not be wrong to ask them why, given evidence that it might be bad. It is still in its infancy, so we should be able to talk about it and dissect it without anger on either side. I find it fascinating that people want this sort of thing, but I guess I am just biologically built that way. I can't imagine being any other way. All right, so let's unpack that a little bit. So they don't explain what points of Brett's and Jordan's that I did not actually accurately refute, so I can't really respond to that. This person says that it should not be wrong to ask people why they're doing what they do, given evidence that it might be bad. I mean, my main point in using Jordan and Brett specifically when I made that video was one, they had a good set of points that I saw people bring up commonly, not just academics, but people in general. So it was a good kind of jumping off point for me to respond. Also, obviously for the views, because you throw in Peterson and Brett and and you get views, but also because it annoyed me that even though they were these public intellectuals who understand the importance of doing the research and understanding what the heck you're talking about, it was clear that from the way they talked about the topic, they hadn't done the bare minimum of research readily available, and yet they would speak with such authority. And I felt that was intellectually lazy of them. I don't expect them to agree with me or even change their mind necessarily if they did more research, but do some research or don't don't really speak about it or say, I don't know a lot about it, but my intuition is X. Fine. You can have an intuition based on your understanding of human psychology or what have you. But like Brett had this whole theory about what polyamorous people are up to where I was just like, okay, you're not really basing that on anything and you're basically mind reading people. So to respond to this person's comment, Brett and Jordan didn't present any evidence in anything where I saw them talking about this. This person also said that we should be able to to talk about it and dissect it without anger on either side. I don't know if they're implying that I'm angry. That was a pretty reasonable video, in my opinion. It was fully scripted. I read verbatim from something that I had drilled into perfection as close as I could get it. I will acknowledge the truth of what this person says, that everyone has their own definition of polyamory, that that is one of the challenges of talking about the topic, because some people use polyamory interchangeably with non-monogamy, and for some people, polyamory denotes close emotion emotional bonds with other people, not just sexual bonds with other people. So yeah, it can be kind of a mess when trying to talk about it. But that's another criticism I had of Peterson that I'm not sure I made in that video.
video, which is that he usually makes it such a distinct point to get definitions in place before he responds about anything. You know, someone asks him if he believes in God, he's like, what do you mean by believe? But nowhere when he's been asked about this, does he go, what do you mean by polyamory? So I felt like that was lazy on his part or inconsistent with his usual intellectual approach. And part of me just wonders if that's because, you know, everyone has their own biases. He's been with the same woman for years, someone he met in his youth. So he's obviously biased toward a deep belief in monogamy and he's talked about it. And Brett's the same way. I don't think he met his wife in childhood, but he's been monogamously with her for years, as far as I'm aware. And one of my other criticisms in that video is that when they were talking about polyamory, they only ever compared it to a totally functional marriage in an ideal scenario. They would talk about all the dysfunctions possible with polyamory, but they weren't comparing apples to apples. They weren't comparing it to the possible dysfunctions of marriage. And as someone who knows people whose marriages have failed spectacularly, and even if you don't know anyone personally, you can dive into the MGTOW community or the MRA community or the Red Pill community, and they can tell you all kinds of stories about the best of intentions with marriage and how it all fell apart. Not saying that no one's marriages work, but not all marriages work and the divorce rate is high. So I'm not saying that everyone's attempts at polyamory work, but some do. And another one of my points was that one of the things that polyamory could gift quote unquote, to monogamous people is to bring more intentionality to defining your relationship and your expectations for what marriage means, especially in the current year where marriage is really an optional thing. It's not like in the past where women, for example, couldn't really earn an independent living. And so you get married to make sure you are secure financially, also to have children and create the future generation. And now not everyone wants to have children and women can earn their own independent living. And so they're like, well, if I'm going to get married to someone then I want like my soulmate or I want this and that and whatever. And people aren't on the same page about what being married even means. So yeah, polyamory means like a lot of different things to people, but so does marriage. I know so many different married people and they take such a different approach to what it means to them to be married and what they do for each other or they don't do for each other, or their expectations, etc. And as for their comment that they might just be biologically built that way, sure. Sure, I definitely think some people are just wired for monogamy or they could make non-monogamy work, but they'd have to do a lot of emotional work on themselves to be in that kind of relationship or they would have to change certain aspects of their personality that probably aren't possible. Like they'd have to be much higher on openness to experience. They'd have to have a much higher craving for emotional intimacy and connection with other people. They'd have to make themselves be more into building new connections with people and maintaining them and dealing with emotional conflict. If you're not into that stuff, picking one person and just sticking with them and not getting involved with anyone else makes a lot of sense. Very good strategy. So their comment was a little more reasonable or calibrated, even though I was like, okay, if you don't actually explain what I didn't refute accurately, I can't either try to respond to what you said, or maybe you're right. Maybe I didn't refute them accurately and maybe I can now think about what I said wrong or how I might reframe things in the future, but I don't have the benefit of that because, you know, this person decided not to uh, not to engage with me in that way, which is their right. If they didn't feel like spending the 30 minutes or whatever to write it out, that's fine. So then this other person a week ago, Scooter Barr, said, I had a whole post that refuted your pseudo-intellectual stance point by point, but I've decided to just put this. You will never be as happy sharing your life with multiple people as those who find that same happiness with a single partner. I cannot be alone in noticing that polyamory tends to appeal to young, emotionally troubled, social contrarians who I would never envy. Where do I even begin with that comment? So one, this person apparently took the time to actually write out a whole post refuting my pseudo-intellectual stance point by point, but then decided not to share it. So I guess they just wasted their time for no reason. Maybe it felt good for them to write out their own thoughts, I don't know. As to the rest of what they said, they say, you will never be as happy sharing your life 
with multiple people as those who find that same happiness with a single partner. I don't know if they're speaking in the general you, if they're directing that toward me or both. I'm pretty sure I said in that video that I think that most people, even people who are polyamorous, tend to pair bond. So they have one person who is, for all intents and purposes, like what you see with anyone else. Their live-in boyfriend and girlfriend, their domestic partner, their husband or wife. And then they have other people that the highest level to which you would escalate would be like having a boyfriend or a girlfriend, but you don't live together, you don't combine finances, etc. You may or may not do things like take trips together, but you see each other regularly, you're sexually involved, the level of emotional intimacy and commitment in that sense is high. So I don't really know what they mean by sharing your life with multiple people. I never said that most people move in with multiple people and have essentially like multiple husbands or wives. I actually said that that's pretty uncommon in the polyamorous community from my experience and that that would be something very tricky to pull off. If by sharing your life you mean being emotionally intimate with people other than your husband or wife or domestic partner, I mean they might be right given that I think most people actually once they get married don't maintain like highly emotionally intimate friendships. Even if they're same sex and there was never any romantic involvement, they tend to be like my husband or wife is like the priority now, they're the person I'm emotionally intimate with and nobody else. But I'm a person that's always had highly emotionally intimate friendships with people, people that have meant as much to me or more than past boyfriends of mine. So I'm not quite clear on what sharing your life with other people means. But I would say that sure, there are certain kinds of people that can find happiness with a single partner, but some people can't and some people don't. Like they're the kind of people that would be really happy if they could just find that one person, but they can't because they're not attractive enough or they live in the wrong place or they waited too long or they're really weird, whatever. And then there are the people that have that happiness requirement of being happy with just the one person and they get lucky enough to find it and maintain it. Good for them. But how does this person know what will make me or any other individual person happy? It's just really weird to me that people have such a strong opinion about what will make other people happy, especially in the realm of relationships, when they often won't take that same kind of stance toward other aspects of someone's life. Like they won't say, you'll never be as happy being freelance as you would working a nine to five, or you'll never be as happy working a corporate job as if you just went and worked on a farm. Like they recognize that people have different skill sets. They have different preferences for the level of autonomy in their career, the level of meaning that some people would prefer to get paid very little, but do work that they consider personally meaningful. And some people would prefer for their work to pay them a lot of money that enables them to have the freedom in their personal life to do things that they find meaningful that they may not get paid for. But when it comes to relationships, people have very strong opinions, whether or not they ever did a psychology degree or have read anything about relationships and what we know about them. Like I understand that people care about the standards that we set in society. Like when Peterson talked about enforced monogamy, the people don't want polyamory to become the accepted default. But I also said in my video that I don't see that ever happening. I think polyamory will always be something like LGBT or non-binary people or anything else where it's a very limited subset of the population. And to their last point that they noticed that polyamory tends to appeal to young, emotionally troubled social contrarians who they would never envy. I feel like there's a term for this, but that's a bias that comes from the fact that people who are emotionally troubled and attention seeking tend to be the ones who talk about what's going on with them. I don't talk much about poly in my general life. The people I'm close to know about my poly worldview and my experience being poly, but I'm not an activist. I'm not an advocate. I wouldn't put in my Twitter bio. And everyone's experience is different, but my experience of other people that I know that are poly, other poly couples, is that they are very normal people, very happy people. One of those couples has been taking a break from the poly lifestyle because they just had a newborn. And yeah, your emotional intimacy well can go very 
very deep, but the physical limitations of time and energy are very finite. So that's where their focus has been. But because they're poly, they still maintain the deep emotional connections, if not the sexual aspects of their connections. And I imagine that after a few years, they might return to that. They might not. But also just because people are poly for years and years and years and then decide to shift toward monogamy for whatever reason, it doesn't mean that polyamory didn't work for them. It did work for them for that period of time. I feel like most poly people, it's like that. The people that are the most vocal are the people that are activisty or it's like part of their worldview and they have to engage this way, etc., etc. Whereas I feel most people are much more pragmatic about it. I know another couple that managed to avoid having to take a real break around having kids because they had created what people would refer to as a polycule where the the people that they were dating also had children and they essentially had a support system so there could be babysitting involved on date nights and things like that which may sound weird to people whatever but they're very normal people they have normal jobs they're definitely relatively wealthy but you wouldn't meet these people and go they're poly weirdos you'd be like they're hot smart people and their children are adorable and they seem very happy together both of those couples i don't think started out poly but they We've both been together since college. Most people don't start out poly. Me and my husband are kind of an exception to that rule. Anyway, I do want to talk more about polyamory on this channel in the future, mostly because I want to talk about my experience doing poly dating on OkCupid and talk about OkCupid in general and how online dating has changed since I got on it in 2014 and that site in particular, but also the other apps like Bumble and Tinder and things like that. But I just thought I would respond to those comments here because it might be interesting for people to hear what I have to say and give me a chance to kind of throw out some more thoughts since I haven't touched on that topic really in any significant way since I made that video, which was a while ago. So that's it for now. If you have any comments, leave them below, email me, etc. Especially if you disagree with me, but you know, explain why you disagree with me, please. Otherwise, thank you for watching. If you liked this video, please give it a like. If you if you'd like to see more, please subscribe and I will have more content for you very soon.